and everybody's here. Hello, everybody. It gives me great pleasure on behalf of the Wolfson Research Institute for Health and Wellbeing, our co-directors, our senior officer, and myself, Amanda Ellison, our director, to welcome you to the latest in our public lecture series today. Our speaker today is Linda Boothroyd. She's a professor of psychology at Durham University. She spent many years researching both human life history theory and interpersonal attraction, with a particular interest in facial masculinity. She's recently focused on body ideals in rural Nicaragua, alongside experimental work both in the laboratory and in the field on the impacts of visual experience on body size preferences. She has a multidisciplinary approach to her research, which is hugely respected in the field and beyond, and that's reflected by the breadth of funding support she's garnered. Linda incorporates perspectives from evolutionary psychology, developmental psychology, social psychology, biological anthropology, and has incorporated a mixed methods component in her current work, which no doubt she'll talk about today. Linda is a long-standing fellow of the Wolfson Research Institute for Health and Wellbeing here at Durham, and her work is well reflected within our youth and women's academies with cross cuts of mental health and culture. In addition, Linda is a trainer for Succeed, the UK edition of an international preventative body image program, and has trained students at Durham and Newcastle in being peer leaders on this program. Linda is currently Vice President of the European Human Behaviour and Evolution Association and is a regular at the Human Behaviour and Evolution Society meetings, as well as the UK's leading body image meeting, Appearance Matters. So it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Linda for her talk relating to visual media and body ideals. Thank you, Linda, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda, for that incredibly thorough introduction. <laughs> it's always funny when you listen to yourself in that kind of in that kind of overview. Um, yes, so um, I'm going to be talking today about um, really the research that we've been doing on how on, on this issue of how visual experience maybe changing what we think bodies should look like and therefore what we want to look like. Um, the picture you can see um, on the screen is uh, from one of my the, the most wonderful places I've ever been, which is um, a village on the Caribbean coast of Nicaragua, where they at the time I was in this visit, they had one tiny solar panel, uh, but other than that, no electricity. And it was incredibly quiet and it was incredibly peaceful. And I just sat in the shade having a, a, a drink and, and watching the, the water of the lagoon lapping. Um, so we do occasionally get to, to um, visit some really lovely places for this research. Um, so um, it's, it's pretty well established that there is quite a great deal of cross-cultural variation in how people think about attractiveness and body size, especially, although not exclusively, in terms of women's bodies. Um, when evolutionary psychology was first becoming popular, everyone was very keen on understanding like the universals of what we find attractive in other people with this idea that we've, we've evolved to prefer certain things because they signify certain qualities of a potential mate, and therefore we should see these commonalities everywhere. Um, but when it comes to body weight, it was fairly evident very early on that that was never going to fly. That was never going to be something that we could think of as a cultural universal. Um, because you only have to look historically to see the variation even within Europe, for instance, in how female body weight has been betrayed. Um, so I have here examples of um, you know very, very early stone representations of the female body. Um, lots of interesting speculation about what this is. Is it a pregnant woman carving herself? Is it someone else carving a beautiful woman? We don't know, but it is a representation of the female body and it is very different from the representations that we would typically expect to see now. Uh, we can also see um, Botticelli painting quite thin figures, but still having a degree of um, curve and visible tummy that, again, we would not see in typical presentations of the female body now. What we tend to see right now is what we see in the swimwear model, which is a woman with very, very low body fat, um, very little in the way of typical curvature around the tummy, no, no spare fat on her arms. Um, and that is 
pretty much universally within Western culture for many years, what was portrayed as the target female body, both for women um, who want to buy these clothes and potentially for men who were looking at you know, actresses on TV and things like that. We can also see the example below, um, a painting um, of Georgiana, Duchess of Devonshire, who was uh, referred to as the most beautiful woman in London. Famously, the only man in London who was not in love with the Duchess of Devonshire is her husband. Um, and then 200 years later, she's been played by Keira Knightley, who um, is a, a particularly uh, low weight actress. Um, although, as far as we know, for her, it's quite healthy. Um, similarly, when we think across cultures, there are cultures where high levels of body fat in women is considered to be um, aspirational. So this is a grandmother um, in North Africa who is deliberately overfeeding her granddaughter um, with a sort of carbohydrate based um, mixture to try and make her put on weight. And as she said, and was translated at the time when I was watching it, when she is fat, she'll be a beautiful woman. So they wanted her to be um, larger in order to make her more attractive to potential husbands. So one of the questions is, where does this variation come from? What is driving it? Um, and again, very, very early evolutionary psychology people were going, well, do we evolve to different preferences and different kind of contexts? Um, but the, there's been evidence for quite a while now that um, people from the same geographical area can, on the basis of some kind of cultural factors, actually have quite different preferences as well. So this is data from Martin Tovey. Um, he and his colleagues um, gave participants uh, 50 images of female bodies of known BMI. So they knew how heavy these women were, so BMI being weight relative to height. Um, they had them rate each each picture for how attractive they thought it was um, and then they can plot the weight of the image and the attractiveness rating it gets um, and they did this with um, a, a sample of uh, Zulus who had traveled to London um, for the purposes of education and they compared them with with Zulus living in KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa um, and we can see there's quite a distinct difference between what they seem to think is attractive. So the Zulus living in Kozulu Natal, um, if we look, nobody, nobody likes the very, very underweight figures. So the, these stimuli were, were gathered from women with eating disorders. So um, they, they, they did go really quite unhealthily low um, in terms of BMI. And, and everyone thought that was not desirable. Um, but as um, basically for the, in Kozulu Natal, as the bodies got bigger, the attractiveness ratings went up. They sort of peaked around about BMI of 25, which from a Western medical perspective would be considered the threshold to starting to be overweight. Um, and they stay high. They stay at that level all the way across to a BMI. I think the heaviest body in the set is 42 point something, which again, from a Western medical model would be considered to be um, very morbidly obese. On the flip side, the Zulus living in London, um, the, the preference function here uh, peaks at around about BMI of 23. So in the mid range of what the Western medical model considers healthy um, and then declines as the, the women become heavier than that point. And what we can do is we, so Tovi et al compared that data with data gathered from black British people. Um, black British people, generally speaking, have preferences for female body weight that are very similar to white British people. There was this idea that you can sort of try and control for, for, for race, but we know that like there's more genetic diversity in all of Africa um, than there is in the rest of the world put together. So black British people aren't necessarily particularly uh, certainly not genetically appropriate as a comparator for, for specifically for Zulus. Um, however, uh, we also know that this is fairly common, whoever you are in the UK. So um, what their preferences shows, like everyone else in the UK, is that they have this peak here at a BMI of about 20. So at the bottom end of healthy. Um, and then as the bodies become larger than that, the, prefer the, the attractiveness ratings drop quite sharply down. So there's a very limited range into what, in terms of what's considered an attractive body weight by this sample, um, and it's at the lower end of healthy. And if we flip between the two, 
graphs, what we can see is that these Zulu migrants living in London have a preference function, which is what we call this, um, this cubic curve here, which is intermediate between uh, their, their compatriots living in Kwasan Natal and the people living around them in the UK. Um, and there's, there's a couple of different ways we can think about how this might happen. Um, and uh, the Martin and I are now collaborators, and the reason we're collaborators is because he and I had a complete disagreement about which was the best explanation for this data. Um, and we had, a, we had a long argument about it at a conference, and then um, later on I emailed him and said, well, why don't we test who is correct? Um, so most of the data I'm going to talk about in the next couple of slides comes from that, that, that study where me and Martin were trying to figure out which of us was right. So here was my explanation. Um, you come to the UK um, and you find yourself surrounded by an environment in which uh, low weight female bodies are visually ubiquitous. So we call this visual diet. It's not diet like food on a plate. It's diet like what your eyes are taking in day in, day out. Um, so every magazine you look at practically around you, you know, if you're walking through a tube station, you're seeing magazines on racks. Most of them have thin women on them. Um, every billboard you go past, every advertisement is like, if it's got a woman, it's likely to be a thin woman. Every time you look at a screen, you are seeing thin women, TV, films, anything like that. So although the weight of the people on the street is a very similar spread to what you would see in, in South Africa, for instance, um, the, the total visual experience is massively overweighted with low weight female bodies. And we know that our brain is constantly using visual experience just to update its latest model of what people look like. That's very well established in faces. Um, it's now, thanks to research we've done and others have done, pretty well established in bodies as well. So potentially just repeatedly seeing thin bodies normalizes that, that becomes your new reference point. And then you judge every other body you see relative to that new reference point. So um, this is how we tested that. Um, so we got, um, we got participants to tell us using pairs of CGI bodies of similar weight going from thin all the way up to heavy. Um, which one they liked and how much they liked it more. And across these pairs of bodies, we could then calculate the participants' overall preference for thinness. So how, how much, how often and how much were they preferring the thinner bodies in this task? We then showed them a series of 40 images that were either of low weight or high weight and were either um, quite glamorous and aspirational or neutral slash potentially even negatively valenced. So, it was the, these are the these are taken from the um, the 50 bodies that the Zulus saw on the previous slide. So the very low weight bodies look quite unhealthy. So it's it's not an aspirational. It's not even a neutral really um, image of thinness. Um, and then after that, they they did the preference task again. And what we find is that for the thin bodies, whether they were models or whether they were quite unhealthy looking um, women photographed in the laboratory, um, we see preference for thinness increase from pre-test to post-test. So looking at these thin bodies, even when they're quite unappealing, um, makes you like thinness more. On the flip side, those who saw the larger weight bodies, whether they were plus size models and plus size beauty queens or um, heavier women in these quite neutral slash unappealing images, preference for thinness came down. So that supports a visual diet hypothesis, because even in these two conditions here, where there's nothing there telling you thin is good or big is good, people's preferences still shifted in that direction. Um, and we have, I, I got some data with some master's students a couple of years ago um, that shows that this process seems to be kicking in um, really from the, the, the earliest stages of puberty, if not before. So we did something similar, but instead of that paired task, um, children and students looked at um, uh, 20, 21 bodies taken from that full range from you know, BMI of 12 to 42. They then saw a whole bunch of thinner bodies or a whole bunch of larger bodies. And then they saw the, 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 the full range again with some extra exposure to thinner or larger bodies as they went. Um, and what we found was that the the effect of condition whether you were seeing thinner or larger bodies 
didn't really significantly differ between our age groups. So basically those who are seeing the thin bodies, um, this is this is uh, the BMI body and this is their perceived weight. So we weren't asking about attractiveness for this experiment. We were just um, asking them to say, do you think this is an underweight, normal weight, overweight body? Um, and what we see is viewing the thin bodies didn't make any difference in this experiment, but viewing the larger bodies um, made you less likely, this is the dotted line here at post-test, to describe those bodies as overweight. So it brought down the threshold of, of what you would consider to be an overweight body when you've been exposed to a lot of overweight images or, or hard, higher weight images. Um, so what this tells us is that the brain is calibrating uh, what it can, what a body looks like on the basis of visual experience without any kind of cultural um, positive messaging alongside those bodies. And it's doing it from 11 years of age, if not earlier onwards. Um, so that's that's really nice evidence for, for a visual diet approach. The other thing, though, is um, we need to think about the, the associations people might actually be learning. And this was this was Martin's explanation for the data. Um, so uh, associative learning is this idea that you learn to associate a particular stimulus with something that is is positive or negative and, th and therefore you like it or dislike it on the basis of that experience. Um, and when it comes to um, thinking about body weight, um, and, and this was Martin's point with his his uh, participants, you know, they came to the UK and they come from an environment in which um, if you are heavy, especially if you're from a from a low SES area, if you're heavy, that means you have access to good nutritional resources. Um, it also means that you probably don't have um, HIV AIDS or, you know, you're, you're not ill with it. And it's, it's uh, a context where, where rates of that are relatively high or where it certainly were at the time of data collection. Um, so, so having a bigger body is sort of an indicator of resources and of health. And his argument was you come to the UK and there you're now surrounded by um, messaging telling you that high, thin is high status. Uh, thin is desirable. Thin is healthy. Being big is is unhealthy. There's big public information campaigns about that, um, and and being big is to be you know to be less important, to be the butt of the jokes, things like that. So you you're learning this association of thin is good as well as just being very exposed to it. Um, so we we ran a couple more conditions. Um, and in this instance, we balanced the visual diet. So participants saw equal numbers of heavier and thinner bodies. Um, but either they gave the sort of UK style message of thin is good, which is by pairing the, the normal weight, the typical uh, low weight models with the um, less, less appealing uh, larger bodies, or we used the countercultural association. So we paired very thin unappealing images with plus size models. Um, we didn't get any change in this first condition. We think this is so embedded that we probably maybe couldn't push it any further. But we did find when we showed people the countercultural association, the preference for thinness came down from pre-test to post-test. Um, so we have this, this effect of seeing this combination of images that can't be because of visual exposure alone, because they see equal numbers of larger and thinner bodies. It has to be because of the association that we've put into those stimuli. Um, so that tells us that looking at thin female bodies a lot shifts what you think a female body should look like, and also that we are potentially susceptible to the cultural messaging around what body weight indicates. And both of these contribute to forming our idea of what we should and potentially want to look like. So how does that actually play out in the real world? Um, I know we've already got the Zulu example, but people could migrate for all sorts of reasons, right? If they're coming to the UK for education, they're higher SES than people who can't come to the UK. The moving itself could be stressful. They might have come to the UK because they were already more um, acculturated into, into sort of European attitudes. Um, so, so let's think about what this means when when we think about exposure people get in situ. Um, uh, so we know that magazines uh, have an awful lot of messaging. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today are the effects, potential effects of dolls for children, because dolls 
are typically of a very particular kind of body shape um, and also what it means when you're exposed to TV, perhaps for the first time, and all of the weight and appearance biases and messaging that exists on TV. Um, so for dolls, um, it was first found oh, 15, 15, 16 years ago um, that if you give girls pictures of, in this study, Barbie and a doll called Emmy, who was sort of typical sort of healthy female body weight, um, and you ask them, you give them sort of stimuli like this and say, like, which is you? Um, and they might choose number four and right, what do you want to look like? And they might choose number two. And that distinction between the difference between the two is what we would term in this instance, body dissatisfaction. Um, uh, there's an error on the slide that should be Dittmar, Halliwell and Ives. <laughs> but what Dittmar Rattel found was that although it wasn't really happening by eight years of age, um, certainly in their younger participants sort of five, six year olds, um, looking at Barbie, seemed to uh, increase body dissatisfaction, it increased the gap between what they thought they looked like and what they wanted to look like. So by changing the body ideal, it then changes the difference between yourself and that ideal and potentially is producing negative body image. Um, we did something sort of similar, but we wanted to look at how um, actually playing with Barbie and other dolls affected body image. And we also wanted to use um, a much more realistic way of assessing body ideals. So girls were uh, given um, an interactive figure choice test like this. So they, they could see a, this computer graphic girl on screen. And this, as they moved the mouse, they could make her bigger or they could make her thinner. And all they had to do was go between the two and stop um, where they thought um, that, was, that was what they wanted to look like, or that was what they did look like. And we also had them do it with an adult body as well uh, to make to make the, the lady as beautiful as possible. So we could look at their adult body preferences. Um, and half of the girls that we worked with played with Barbie and a Monster High doll. Um, and the other half played with a Lottie doll, which is based on the body of a nine year old and a Dora doll, which has a sort of um, she's a slightly round um, six year old body shape. Um, so what we found was, um, it's a bit of a complicated graph, but the main thing is that for ideal self, um, if they played with the skinny dolls, which is in blue, their ideal self got significantly thinner. There was a slight increase if, in their ideal self um, if they played with the sort of childlike dolls. Um, their ideal adult borderline got significantly thinner. And if we looked at body dissatisfaction, the gap between what they thought they looked like and what they wanted to look like, again, we see that playing with the skinny dolls made that dissatisfaction worse. So their ideal body got thinner relative to their actual body. Um, and if they played with the healthy child doll, body dissatisfaction improved. So the gap between ideal self and um, an actual self got smaller um, or even slightly positive. Um, so that tells us, and we, we replicated um, the, the skinny doll effect in a, in a second study in the same paper. Um, for, for clarity, this is the difference between the, the ideal self in before and after. So it's not a big gap, but it's, but actually it's going from a, a, a sort of a thin, a slim child with a tiny tummy, oops, to a slim child with no tummy. And, and that's, I think, quite important because that could be, that area can be a real focus in, in eye tracking studies in terms of how women with body dissatisfaction look at their bodies, sort of looking around there and looking at these markers of body weight. Um, it's not just us. So at the time we started, Dit Maratel was the only other paper. Um, but we now have multiple papers showing that playing with ultra thin dolls is associated with an increase in body dissatisfaction or an increase in thin ideal internalization or a change in um, eating patterns. And, and it's not that body dissatisfaction is significant in every study, but every study finds some effect um, of playing with ultra thin dolls on girls' um, cognitions around eating and their bodies. Um, so, and this is a ubiquitous form of visual experience and physical tactile experience for children as well. It's incredibly um, incredibly common form of play and maybe 
uh, shaping what uh, girls think they want to look like, at least in that early prepubertal phase of life. Um, so that's that's dolls in children uh, in the UK and North America and Australia. What we've also been doing is looking at the effect of TV access in rural Nicaragua. Um, before I continue, I have to say that this is a study where um, I, I, you know, I did I did all the paperwork and I analysed a lot of the data, but for most of the time I was sat in my office and the people actually out uh, getting bitten by insects and collecting data were my my team, uh, Jean Luc and Tracy. So the amazing data set we have is entirely entirely to their credit. Um, so we were working in the Pearl Lagoon Basin, which is this area here on the Caribbean coast of Nicaragua. We also got some data from Managua, the capital as well. Um, villages in this area are um, rapidly differentiating. Um, so we, we worked in villages um, like this one where they still lived in very traditional board houses with leaf roofs. Um, and this is the one from the start where I was looking across the lagoon um, and at the time of data collection, they had no electricity when we started the study at all. Um, there are also some sort of transitional board houses with with metal roofs and they're, they're also now getting to be concrete houses. Um, and the government has been putting electricity cabling into some communities and not others, depending on their geographical location. So we're, you're getting increasing differences between villages in terms of their level of TV access without always big differences in terms of um, their economic situation, for instance. It's just fortuitous, does your village get electricity or not? And if your village gets electricity and you have a bit of money, you can buy a Claro dish and get satellite TV, which includes a lot of Latin, Amer Latin American stuff, a lot of telenovelas, but also Hollywood movies and, and American and British TV shows dubbed into Spanish as well. Which is interesting because the people here, their first language is usually Creole English, but Nicaragua, um, obviously the, the dominant language is Spanish, so, so is the TV. Um, so it's it's a very different kind of setting for us um, and the data is necessarily a little bit noisy sometimes because of that. So this is the regional capital Bluefields, but once you've got there by multiple planes, you then have to take a boat up to Pearl Lagoon Town itself, um, commercial panga to there, and then we were having to get um, just get somebody with their speedboat to take us to the communities from there. Um, sometimes it was very difficult to collect data at all because of things like rainy seasons. Um, and when we were collecting data, it wasn't like we would do it in this nice controlled way in the laboratory um, in, in, in the UK or in a, in a university in a city anywhere in the world, really. Um, it was about using opportunistically community buildings or someone's house um, um, or in one instance, a, a um, lagoon side a cabana bar um, and turning it into a research space. So this is John Luke posing for the camera in, to, to demonstrate um, how data collection worked in these studies. So um, what we did was show our participants um, the exact same 50 bodies that the Zulus had seen that right from the start of this talk. Um, and we plotted their preferences in exactly the same way. Um, in, the, in the study, I'm gonna, the, the paper I'm gonna talk about today, um, we used a fully ethnically balanced sample because this region is quite diverse. Um, so we had 320 participants from seven villages. Um, two were predominantly Miskiti, which is um, an indigenous Amerindian group. Two were Mestizo, which is um, Spanish speaking people of predominantly, although not entirely European um, ancestry. And three were predominantly Garifuna, which is um, a, a black African and black Carib descent um, ethnic group in the area. And we made sure we had high and low media access villages for each of those three ethnic groups. Um, we assessed their acculturation, so how much they thought in Spanish or, in, or international English, um, although it turned out that was basically, are you mestizo or not? So we didn't really do much with that. Uh, but we also asked how hungry they were, how long it had been since they ate, since, you know, we want to go, well, do people just like big bodies when they're hungry? We asked about their annual income, if they had any cash income, which some of them did, years of education, how much TV they had watched in the last week. Um, and then we assessed their preferences for BMI and also for body shape in terms of waist to hip ratio um, using the, those 50 bodies that I showed you earlier. 
Um, what we found, the headline is that in terms of predicting BMI and waist hip ratio ideals, what was important was just TV consumption and education and ethnicity. Those three things pretty much sucked up all of the variation um, in that data. Um, so this is the data plotted by um, Village. The black line is the capital Managua. That looks like European data, so preference, pe preference peaks at sort of about 21. Um, and then as the bodies get bigger, the ratings just come down again. Um, and what we found was that the villages with the lowest levels of TV, which are the solid lines. So this is a, a, a low TV Garifuna village. This in purple is a low TV Mosquito village. Um, it's harder to see with these green lines here for the mestizos, but it's just it's just happening at the top end there too. What we see is that the villages with less TV access, these functions are peaking higher. So for this very low TV village, these two very low two villages here, the, this red and purple solid line, it's peaking at about 27 and then it's staying pretty high or only dropping a little bit. Whereas in the, the dashed line villages where they have more TV, we're seeing more of this typical decline as the bodies get bigger. And in terms of waist to hip ratio, so the, the bigger your waist to hip ratio, the wider your waist relative to your hips. So the less curvy that bit of your, the less, the less your waist curves in. Um, and, and a narrow waist to hip ratio is, is, quite, is quite popular, um, both currently and historically in, in Western cultures. And what we find again is that for the solid line villages, this line here is flatter. And that means as the body gets less curvy and as the waist gets bigger, their scores for attractiveness don't come down as much as say, like this data from Managua, or here, this high median mosquito village, where as the bodies get less curvy, the attractiveness scores really drop um, because they, they, they like the body with a, the, the curvier, curvy in waist. Um, and so for both of these, TV consumption was really, was really important at the individual level in predicting what kind of body size and shape people liked. Um, if you remember, the, the village where I sat and, and looked at the lagoon did at one point have a tiny solar panel, um, which was used to power one TV. And furthermore, although they couldn't watch TV at home, they could go to other communities to visit, um, typically in paddle boats, so it was it was hard work, but they could go and when they were when they were away, they would get exposure to TV. So we looked in this village um, and compared a couple of Mestizo villages as well at two or three different time points, um, both when they didn't have TV, when they had TV, and then when they stopped using it because the, they were trying to save the, the power for other things. Um, and if we looked at the individuals where we have multiple data points, what we find for this village where TV came and went is that the more TV they had been watching in the week before we tested them on any given occasion, um, the lower their ideal body was. So they they preferred thinner bodies than they did at other times if they've been watching more TV than they've been able to at other times. So this shows change within individuals with TV access coming and going, which again suggests that TV access itself is actively changing body ideals. And just to be sure, we also uh, did an experiment. So we did almost exactly the same experiment I showed you before. We did it in the in in the villages in the field. So we had 73 participants um, from a Garifuna village and a Mestizo village, um, none of whom had access, regular access to TV. Um, they, they did a very similar interactive test to the little girls in the doll study. So they, they made this body sort of reasonably sort of generically sort of could be mestizo, um, could be, you know, general Latin American body. And they made her bigger or smaller, indicated what they thought was ideal. Um, they did that for four bodies before and four bodies after. And in the middle, they viewed typical catalog models. Again, we tried to get a bit of ethnic balance to represent what um, Nicaraguan TV actually looks like, which is not all white people. It's, they've got, um, they got quite a few Latino and um, dark skinned people in there as well, relative to British media. Um, so they saw typical low weight models or they saw plus size models. 
Um, so what did we find? We find we found exactly what we always find. So those who had looked at the high weight bodies, their ideal woman got heavier. Those who had looked at the low weight bodies, their ideal woman got thinner. Um, so we saw exactly the same thing in these people who have relatively low levels of experience with visual media as we see in participants in the lab and online in the UK and North America. So that really does emphasize that something is definitely going on here with visual media. Um, I'm going to go through the next few slides quite quickly because I don't want to go on for too long, but I think it's important to note that everything I've just described to you involves us giving participants stimuli that we have predetermined and we have pre-collected and saying, do you like these bodies, basically? Um, now that, that's not necessarily entirely representative of the real preferences of people in this area. Um, so what we also did, and this was really led by Tracy, was both use um, uh, avatar creation software to go, right, take this body and make it look exactly how you think it should look, changing you know, all sorts of aspects of the body shape, but also run focus groups to try and tap into what people thought about when they thought about um, bodies and appearance and attractiveness and TV and things like that. Um, and in terms of the male data, so we've got we've got men looking at men, men looking at women, women looking at women. Um, so far, what's published is the men looking at women data, uh, where we saw a very strong effect of TV access. So this is comparing. So uh, the village A, village C are both Creole, uh, Creole speaking Garifuna villages. Um, so this is the village that had that very high weight preference that I showed you in the earlier slide. This is the, the Garifuna village that had the lower weight preference. And what we see is that the ideal woman, according to men who are much more exposed to visual media, is much, much thinner, but particularly in the lower body um, and has a much smaller waist re relative to both the lower body well, smaller hips relative to the upper body, um, but also um, a smaller waist relative to the, the upper body. Um, and this is a, an intermediate village here. Um, and if we look at, at the individual level, what we were finding, if you, if you try and extract different components from these bodies, is that the more TV access, but also the more hungry someone was, um, the, the smaller they made the body, so hang on, more hungry, let, yeah, let's focus on TV. So the, they made the body smaller if they watched more TV. They made the waist smaller relative to the breast, so the breast got a bit bigger, and they also made the, the hips smaller relative to the breast. So slightly bigger breasts, but much smaller hips and, and slightly smaller waist as well. Um, so that suggests that it's not just about weight, it's also about changing sort of how female bodies are represented to be slightly closer to the Western thing, where typically our actresses are thin and often have large breasts you'd expect for a woman of that weight, for instance. Um, and in terms of how people thought about this when they were thinking about it, the, the really interesting thing was that for the men talking about women, um, if they weren't being asked about a potential wife, what was important to them was that she was clean, that she had good morals, that she kept a house and wouldn't go off with someone else. Um, and they only really got talking about body shape when they were talking about women that they might want to sleep with, when actually they were very interested in the curves. And the reason they were interested in the curves is because curves were really important when you're dancing and dancing and movement and walking around is really important because dancing is good and because movement is really important in sex. Um, so it was it, one of the really interesting things was we, 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 we worry quite rightly about the sexualization of women within media and social media in in um, Europe and North America. Um, in this context, it's from the qualitative data here, the women were already very sexualized. Um, it was just playing out in a different kind of body size emphasis, um, such that the, the, the ideal body was very different and actually puts women under less body image pressure because it's, it's easier to be bigger to a certain extent. Um, uh, at least when you have lots of access to cheap palm oil, which they do, and you can fry your food when you have food, which you don't always. Um, so in one sense, it's easier to maintain it. But on the other hand, it's still it's still resulting in objectification. Objectification is still going on. It's just happening in a different way. And it's happening interpersonally 
even when it's not happening in the media. So I thought that was quite an interesting aspect of all of, all of this, that, that sexualization and objectification doesn't go away when you don't have media. Um, but we also looked at men, looking at men, as I said. Um, so this is data that Tracy got comparing the participants in Nicaragua with a sample in Uganda and in the UK. And they looked at, I think the important row is this one down here. So male bodies varying from very low muscle mass to very high muscle mass. What we find in the UK is preferences sort of really cluster around here. So um, some muscle without being very, very hypermuscular. So not liking this one, not liking this one, mainly preferring this one. Um, whereas in both Nicaragua and Uganda, there was much more of a kind of, yeah, you know, whatever, whatever body. There, you know, there was the people weren't. There wasn't a specific muscularity ideal. Um, and for the Nicaraguan data, the preference is sort of peaking at low and at high. So some liked this one and some liked that one. But again, from the qualitative data, we were finding that men were talking about the importance of building muscle. They were talking, and I heard someone say this when he was being being interviewed, um, about wanting to look like the look like the action men, wanting to look like the you know the, the men in action films that they were seeing on TV and the sports stars that they were now seeing on TV. So certainly the qualitative data, qualitative data and the observational data shows that although there isn't a strong muscular ideal yet um, across the entire community, uh, we certainly are seeing um, increasing interest by men in acquiring a muscular body, which they will explicitly tie into their experiences of watching visual media. So that then is playing into, into potentially changing body ideals and poten potential appearance pressures for men as well. Um, and the last bit of data I will talk about is um, actually looking at uh, eating disorder risk in this population. So um, it's been posited for decades now that socio-cultural factors, so that your, your social and cultural inputs uh, can shape body dissatisfaction, much as I've been talking about in this talk, and via feeling depressed and creating a lot of negative um, emotional um, pressure and trying to diet and trying to control your eating, that can combine in eating disorders. So this is pretty well, this is very well established um, in, in um, European, North American, Australian data sets. Um, we don't have a great deal of evidence for how this plays out, where appearance pressures are relatively novel and where the thin ideal is very novel. Um, so what Tracy did was she, she measured internalization, body satisfaction and eating disorder risk in women in the Pearl Lagoon region. Um, and without giving you all the, all the regression model outputs, what we found was exactly what you find in, um, in um, high income populations, which is that women who were internalizing the thin ideal more had higher risk of pathological eating attitudes, and that was being mediated by body dissatisfaction, specifically a measure of body dissatisfaction that isn't about I, I feel bad about my body, but I don't like this aspect of my body, and I don't like this aspect of my body. So internalization of the thin ideal was increasing body dissatisfaction, which was increasing their, their scores on measures of eating disorder risk. Um, and this ties in very neatly to some longitudinal data from Fiji from 20 years ago, which showed that when TV was introduced to Fiji, um, levels of eating disorders increased within two years. Um, it, it, was a, it was a different context. Um, it was partly just about you know, signal coming in. Um, people who were, were able to maintain a relatively stable diet um, at the time. But we, we, we clearly saw this increase in eating disorder risk there. And now we're able to show with this data that it seems to be following the same kind of um, pattern as we see in, in other cultures as well. So in terms of that work, I think just some very quick reflections. Um, I don't want you to, as I said, this, some of this data is quite noisy um, and we had to be a bit flexible in how we went about the research. Um, so it wasn't great that we used Western stimuli, although we tried to counter that. Sampling was really challenging because people felt that if they were going to come and talk to us for an hour, that was work. So we had to pay them. And once we pay them, people will then bring along their friends and relatives. So this isn't like a nice, neat, 
fully randomized balanced sample in some communities we tested every single adult there was so that's fine that's 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 representative because it's whole population in other villages of like 200 people where we tested 40 there's going to be some probably some biases that we, we were really testing small groups within that community but that's that's just what we had to do it was pretty weird for them being asked to look at these bodies and like assign ratings to them it's like what, what are you talking about um and obviously it was it was unconventional and challenging for us but by being flexible we got this massive sample um and using the mixed methods i think was really valuable and this is a study that completely converted me to using qualitative research um as, as part of my research program because it made such a massive difference um, and yeah, when you go into these new field sites, you really have to, you have to be holistic about it and, and accept the variation. So I want to make a caveat that um, at the time that we did this research, the only access to visual media people had was TV. You had TV or you didn't. There was no good signal for smartphones. There were very few smartphones there and they don't have magazines. Now, smartphones are ubiquitous. Signal for smartphones is getting much, much better. People, even if they don't have signal at home, will go somewhere else, download material and bring it back on their phones. Um, and certainly the, the more recent qualitative data we've got from teenagers in the last year really shows that for them, it's social media that's important rather than traditional media. Exactly like we find in the UK and America, it's just that they've gone through that process much more rapidly. Um, and I, I think this is a really interesting picture. So this was um, this was in a village where they can't upload and download photos or they couldn't at the time, but they did have photos. They did have cameras so they could start taking photos of each other. They don't have mirrors. So this was the only way they could actually look at themselves. Um, and these two girls were playing around and wanted me to take their picture. And they did they hung from trees. They pulled faces. They told me they were monkeys. Um, and then they did this. Um, posing just like you see on social media from the Kardashians and um, Cardi B and, and, and lots of um, lots of female celebrities of whom those were examples of women that um, teenagers in this, this area follow. So we're seeing they probably got it from their big sisters, but we're seeing now this this change, not just in body weight ideals, but also self presentation, which is almost certainly tied into social media use. Um, and so what we're doing now with the current grant is we're working in Nicaragua with um, local people to adapt and develop media literacy educational materials. Um, and we're working with the local education ministry to test those out in schools to see if they're going to work. And we're also looking at um, low SES communities in the Caribbean coast of Colombia in Barranquilla. Um, and also in Zimbabwe, we had to drop the Seychelles because COVID is just, we're not going to be able to do that there. Um, but so we're working with the more rural, the more low SES populations that aren't typically included in this kind of research to see if they're going to be, if it's going to be useful for them to have this kind of material as well. So uh, it just remains for me to thank my, my amazing collaborators, uh, Liz, Martin, Tracy, Jean-Luc, um, uh, the Leverhulme Trust who funded the Nicaragua work the first time around and Welcome Trust who are funding us now. And uh, thank you for your time and do you have any questions? <laughs>